Shall I start then? Please wait. We are starting. Yeah, we are starting. Just wait. Okay, now we are starting this program uh, because precisely we have only 35 minutes. So friends, welcome to the third session of South Asian Online Literary Conference being jointly organized by the Sahit Academy and the foundation of SARC Writers and Literature. We have three participants in this session, namely Mr. Najibullah Ajad from Afghanistan, and uh, he must be joining our program. Uh, number two, Ms. Ilya Bhattarai from Nepal and Srimati Kamla Vijay Ratne from Sri Lanka. Uh, these participants will be presenting their short stories. Each participant will be reading one story each. And uh, Ms. Kamla Vijay Ratna, besides presenting one of her short stories, will also be chairing this session. We have a total of around 30 minutes for this session and I would request each participant to take around 10 minutes and please adhere to this time limit. I also request all of you to introduce yourself before you make your presentation. First of all, I invite uh, uh, Ms. Ilya Bhattarai from Nepal to make her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Ilya Bhattarai from Nepal. Uh, I like to write short stories, travelogues, and children's stories. I'm right now the chairperson of Nepal Literature Development Council, Nepal chapter, and the general secretary of Nepali Women's Literary Organization, Gunjan. Now, I'm, I've um, published five short stories book, and five travelogues book, and one children's stories book. And uh, now I'm going to read my uh, story, Biplavi. Biplavi, hmm. what sort of a name is it? A wave of rays surges in her mind, even at the, the, name of the name they used to call her. Who are they to give a name to someone else? Do I not have any my own name given by my parents that they have to give me again? Hmm. Biplavi. Even at the moment her heart is pounding more than ever why has she been unable to adjust herself with these people and this environment though it has been ever so long since she came here her to them she cries her heart out ceaselessly with a series of terrible hiccups Poor little girl. She cannot even cry openly in front of all. She doesn't even want to imagine the physical torture she will have to undergo from the leader if he finds out she has been weeping like this. Still, even at the moment, she cannot hold back her tears, so she hides. But she has learned how to
Ilya ji, your voice is not. Your city, nobody can hear you. Hey. However, nobody knows why even their list, um, um, even after listening to their ever so so many existence and species, this word failed to impress her. She had not in the least been able to digest their words. She could not justify that the game of violence they were enjoying was right at all. She was never happy with their acts of forcing the innocent to follow their words and kill them without rhyme and reason. They had power in their hands, but it didn't mean that they could play with others' lives, uncaring for their troubles and wills. She could never stand such astrocious activities. However, what could she do? She was helpless like a bird in the cage and in front of a barrel of the gun. She had to act like she had also changed. She had just turned 13 at that time. She had passed the 12 years of childhood admits the killings, the fear, violence, and the nausea stains rampant in her surroundings. Since her childhood, she had been encumbered with the violence raised by the terrorists from her own surroundings. She had also witnessed the operations of her neighbors by the security persons in the name of giving them security. Her parents had a terrible fear that these people might ad abduct their daughter like they did other children in the village. As they began abducting young children, even from their classroom, her parents stopped sending her to school. Though she was at home, her parents never felt secure. The ever blossoming body of their daughter who was in the first class of youth would further stir the edge in their hearts. They had not abducted any Brahmin girl from the village so far, maybe because they had been married off and gone somewhere else by the time they, they reached the right age to abduct it by the people. Being a person involved in the field of education himself, her father hesitated to break the law and go for child marriage. And so their daughter, who was on the verge of adolescence, was still with them. Two of the abductors were familiar to her. They were the um, untouchable from her own village in school. This is the last part of the story. These boys were some great seniors to her. They had disappeared from the village a few years ago. The villagers had a sneaking suspicion that they might have been involved in the gang of the enjoy, the game of the killing and violence. No one else in the village knew what the reality was though. After all, the suspicion was true, but who could Seated. In the meantime, all, the sudden, all of the sudden, the leader, like person from the group, pointed to her and said to her father, we have decided to recruit this girl in our people's liberation army. Now onwards, along with us, she will also struggle for the liberation of the proletariat, pack her personals and belongings into a bag. We'll take her with her right away. These words from the leader came as a trouble thunderbolt to her parents. Unex the unexpected shock renders them senseless. They could not think of what they had to do. However, as they came to their sen senses after a moment, they understood the complexity of the problem. Master, my daughter is still young. The young child doesn't know how anything about the world. How can she understand what you say? She's even scared of the prim Petty mouse, master, how can the terrible coward the fight in your ever, ever so big war? Do separate my daughter. We'll be at your back and sell. We are ready to cook for you and need uh, feed you whatever you wish. We are ready to feed as many as people as you say. But we implore you, do separate this young child. Do not say that you will take her with you. In front of her, the, <clears throat> the poor girl in those days, she knew nothing about the price she had to pay for being born in the higher caste. Her abduction was not for the sake of revolution, rather it was done in the spirit of revenge against the higher caste. On the very night she reached the camp, the abductor leader came to initiate her into the revolution. While the child was crying at the top of her voice as she was being physically and mentally tormented, he had mirrored the liberation of destitute, the helpless and prelitated in her heart rending cry. The more she jerked and wailed with pain, the more he cried with greater pleasure.
thus having quenched the sexual thirst of the leader she was initiated into the path of the revolution the next morning the leader had duly named her biplavi that is a revolutionary so as the in instigate the revolutions she spat contemptuously right there the night the leader had told her rather a lot of things about the revolution then he told then he congratulated her for getting the opportunity to participate participate in the revolution however the, the revolution she was supposed to bring about was slightly different actually she didn't have to wear a gun for the revolution all she had to do was uh, satiate the others hunger they say a man with a empty uh, stomach an empty heart cannot fight hence she had to cook for the fighters to satiate their stomach and she had to lie in the bed to quench their physical thirst as they they say it was the people's war she could fight from her side the sake of the proletariat they say it was a sort of revolution she had brought about putting up her dignity for action under coercion they say the revolution she was brought about in the society is to satiate them from her body and to stir them to part- participate in the people's war in this way the child who was become biplavi by engaging in kitchen chores and striping of their beds is wagging a mighty people's war thank you namaskar thank you ulia ji biplavi it was a very good story and we could listen to you clearly you. in later part yes i request shrimati kamla vijay ratne from sri lanka to make her presentation kamla ji thank uh, adit ji of swal and the sahitya academy for inviting me to read my short story and to chair this session uh, the title of my show, uh, uh, i am a poet a short story writer and a novelist and i was given the highest uh, state literary award entitled the sahitya ratna in 2019 in recognition of my work as a writer uh, the title of my short story is the weight uh, i'm going to read my short story now uh, she sat on the bench at the edge of the lawn under the jacaranda tree the tree was gnarled and old with a few flowers blooming on the leafless branches she thought like me and she looked at her fleshless arms and the shriveled skin of her legs she leaned against the backrest of the bench and stretched her hands to pluck the purple flowers along with the two flowers and the bud a blob of fungus too dropped into her palm how long ago she mused how long ago when she and her husband visited the flowering plant show and bought this jacaranda plant yes 40 42 years ago she was 28 and expecting their eldest daughter she was herself a mother now she had a good family a caring husband two boys doing well in school her second a boy was doing well too she reflected with the blessings of the noble triple gem he had his own business she was proud of her children yes she and her husband had to work hard deny things she remembered how one day her mother in law had opened a small wardrobe and exclaimed daughter you have such a few sarees yes cut down on things for herself no new clothes no jewelry no stylish life they saw the children through school and university and into life the two all the children a woman and a man now were well settled but the youngest the youngest was not here he was in canada has been for the last 5 years she worried about him he was not settled how many times she tried to find a suitable partner for him how many pretty girls she went into a paroxysm of coughing 
The woman who looked after her came running into the garden. It's getting late. It's getting late. It's chilly. Look, Nona, let's go inside. She waved her away. Bring me some water, Daya. She said hoarsely. It was not the weather, she knew. It was her body. It was packing up. She had known now for the last three years that she had a cancer in her liver. The nausea and vomiting and the abdominal pain had been a constant. She had been shown to the best consultants by her daughter, but she knew there was no cure. She remembered her husband dead the last five years, gone like a dewdrop on a blade of grass. It was so easy for him, that pain on the back of the left shoulder, at least that was what she thought, compared to what she was going through. The sleepless nights, she had to seek the help of sedative painkillers. She had to dose herself daily and the injections, so many and so painful. She put her hand to her head. Her head was bare, just a few sprinkling of hairs. The chemotherapy had devastated her hair. She had had a long head of hair and it was thick and dark. Yes, she was old like this. Jacaranda tree she had planted. Fungus riddled, dead branches splintering and falling apart. Rarely a few sickly flowers blooming. She knew her end was near. This last reading of her body scan was ominous. The cancer had spread to her in spite of the huge doses of drugs and the chemotherapy administered from time to time. She knew she had reconciled to the end, but not now, not this month or next month, not the next month either, because she waited, she wanted to be alive when her younger son arrived. She knew there had been communications between him and his older siblings regarding her condition. She had spoken to him on Skype, but then they had both hedged. She didn't express her fears to him, neither did he to her. They had kept the conversation light and short, played hide and seek with each other. But now the truth was out. His brother and sister must have urged him to come. Come, mother, he's going to go. She waited eagerly for him to come. He was coming at last after five years. He must be changed. She got worse and, and was admitted to a nursing home. She found it difficult to write or even to phone. Her daughter held the phone against her ears. When are you going to come? She whispered. I'm waiting for you to come, she pleaded. I'm coming, I'm coming, mother. I'm coming on the 30th of March. She was finding it difficult to breathe. They put her on an artificial respirator. She had to be fed intravenously. Her body was getting more and more immobile, but her eyes were bright and looked keenly at her children as they came to see her. Today is the 29th of March. You, your, your brother will come tomorrow. I want to wear the dress. He brought me last time he came. Eranga, bring that dress when you come tomorrow morning. Eranga promised. She took the dress to her that day and dressed her mother in it. She was sinking, but her eyes were bright with hope. The day passed. The flight was due early in the morning, but no sun. She looked inquiring. She looked inquiringly at her daughter. She shook her head. They have stopped all the flights, Amma, she explained. Softly, the airports are closed. My brother can't come. She let go the grip of her body and closed her eyes. She felt herself floating away on a cloud. Okay, that's the end. Okay.
Thank you, Kamla ji. It was a very good and emotional story. Uh, and uh, since our third participant, Mr. Najibullah Ajad, I think he could not join us due to some technical issues or internet issues. He is an Afghani writer. But he is now shuttling between Germany and USA in exile. Okay, okay. No, whether he is in Germany or USA, he is not in Afghanistan. He fled in Afghanistan. Okay. So, madam, would you like to say a few words before we conclude? These are excellent stories. And since I'm a short story writer, I can appreciate that. Thank you, Kamdaji. Thank you, Patajan. Thank you for having me as usual. And it's so nice to see you. Thank I you for having me also. I nice to meet you also, Ilya. Very nice story. Yeah. yeah. And I, Thank I know you, Thank you, this is the particular experience of Nepal. I know I have read a lot about the, uh, the revolution in Nepal, you know, and I have friends, Prakash Subedi and Kesha yes. Sijel, I think. So through yeah. them, I knew about the revolution that was, you know, uh, the, the, especially the killing, especially the horror. Yeah. You know, yeah. the people yeah. suffered, yeah. you know. So yes. we have had the same experience for 30 years. Yes, yes, yes. I know, I know. I know, ma'am. I know, ma'am. Thank you, Ajit, ma'am, for having me, for inviting me. Thank okay. you, Koshwal. I, 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 on behalf of Sahit Academy and the Foundation of Sark Writers and Literature, thank all of you for participating in this lively session. I also thank all those who joined us in this virtual program. And uh, I must tell you that this will be a four-day program spanning into 25 long sessions. So people who have joined us in this program may also uh, take part in other programs as well. Namaste and thank you very much. Namaste. Very thank much. You. Thank, thank you, Sahitya Academy. Thank you.